from the tomb. Lovingly he greets us, scatters fear and gloom. Let the church with gladness hymns of triumph sing. For her Lord now liveth, death hath lost its sting. Lord! for our second session is our brother David Playle. I'm sure he's known to most of you. A man who is spending his life furthering the kingdom of God. He served with us on the Home Missions Council. He was the organizer, the administrator of the Herald Scheme. He had such an input into it encouraging many lovely young men and women. We're so glad he's been free. He's traveling quite a bit, visiting Romania. But he's here with us this morning with his wife, Rosemary. We thank God for them. We love them. God bless him. God bless him with the message that he's going to bring to us now. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you, Stan. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, we do believe that your hand is upon us and that you want to speak to our hearts this morning on every opportunity. And we ask you to help us, quicken your word to us, open our minds to receive from you, Lord. Open our hearts to sense your love and presence and your care for us. Be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I do appreciate the invitation to be here this morning and to share something with you and speak to you about something that's very close to my heart. The whole thing about leadership, I think, is the key to the work of God, really. If the leaders are there in position and working together, the people of God feel more secure. And it's a well-known fact that sheep that we're likened to so often in the Word of God will not feed if they're not secure. And when they see a group of leaders who are secure in themselves and working in harmony together, they'll feed. And if they feed, they grow. And if they grow and feed well, they reproduce and the kingdom of God extends. That's good logic, isn't it? And so it's a very important subject. So I do appreciate the privilege of being invited by the Home Missions Council. Great bunch of fellows to work with. Always good fun to be with, and yet hard workers, and uh, the friendships go on. They're very, very precious. The subject they've given me this morning is being a leader, not the leader. Being a leader, not the leader. And in one way or another, I want to try and keep emphasizing that while I'm talking this morning, because I believe that we are looking at a principle of teamwork which some may still have problems identifying with. We know there are leaders in the Church of Jesus and in the local church, which is what I'll be concentrating on, but there has to be, I believe, the leader among a group of leaders. We'll come back to that in a moment. There's a little saying that came to mind when I was first given the subject. I'm sure you could finish it for me if I start to say it. It takes more grace than tongue can tell to do what? play the second fiddle well, right? And the whole thought behind that is that it takes a lot of grace 
to not be number one. That's right, isn't it? If something in you wants to be in charge, and for some reason or other, that isn't your privilege, it can take a lot of grace, especially when you look at things being done and you know you could do them better. Is that right? So that's something to think about. I've noticed an interesting thing about leadership. In churches, there are people often who are clamoring to be in leadership. They almost walk around with an invisible sign on their back that only the leaders of the church can read, and it says, I am leadership potential, please spot me. It's true, their whole attitude and demeanor is there. And one brother in a church I was leading once, he kept saying to me, why don't you ask me to preach? I said, because you keep asking. <laughs> right? It's the attitude, isn't it? I've noticed with those folk that very often when they do come into a position of leadership, pretty soon they're wishing they were out of it because they don't really realize the responsibilities and you can't fully appreciate them until you're in it. How many of you this morning are Adrian Plass fans? Never heard of him, goodness me. Well, Adrian Plass is the uh, name given to a guy who writes in Family Magazine. And he wrote an interesting little diary article a while back now in Family Magazine. It went something like this. I am a house group leader. I have been appointed. And he went on to say, repeating this in various ways, I am a house group leader. I am a house group leader. I am a house group leader. And he was full of the joys of this and excited about all the privileges that went with it. And then his first task was to make sure that the chairs were arranged in the right way for the Sunday morning service. So he thought, no problem, I'll phone the members of the house group and get them organized to do it. The first man he telephoned, he said, well, I'm sorry, he said, but I'm, I'm busy tonight, I can't help you. The second one said, well, I'll seek the Lord and ask my wife about it. <laughs> Adrian Plass said, with a competition like that, the Lord didn't stand a chance. And the third man he telephoned, the fellow said, well, there's a problem here, Adrian. What do you mean? Well, he said, you have to understand that 20 years ago, when those chairs were purchased, I was against the purchase of those chairs. <laughs> And it would be against my principles and against my conscience to even touch them, other than sit on them. Such are the joys of leadership. You come into the firing line, don't you? I want to put something up on the screen in a moment with the help of my lovely assistant, Rosemary. She's not going to stand up and curtsy, but she's there. And uh, our concept of leadership and leaders other than the leader has traditionally been for many years, that the pastor, if he's the leader, he's got to be the pastor. We assume that. He may not be a pastor in the sense of gift. But that this man who's in charge of the church desperately gets overloaded, so he looks around for some help. And Rosemary will uncover this as I speak about it. That this young man, he may well be the youth leader, of course. But he is also caretaker. He's the pianist. He's a preacher sometimes. He's the song leader. He's a minibus driver. He is good at plumbing when the toilets are leaking. He's a window repairer. He's a visitor. He's a photocopy boy. He's a good typist. He's a chauffeur. And he's an errand boy. And of course, with all these qualifications, he must be an ex Task Force 2000 member. <laughs> and such a young fellow comes into the role of helping. I'm talking about, of course, the assistant pastor bit of a superman, you know. <laughs> and he's got to do everything to take the load off the pastor's back. Now, I would like to say that, that that has often worked, but I believe that biblically there is a better concept than that. That's what we're looking at this morning. The title of this lecture, thank you, presupposes and implies the idea of a team. Two or more people working together to lead a local church. And that's what I want to confine myself to this morning. But where we're recognizing the fact, by the virtue of the subject tomorrow morning, that one of those has to be the main man, the leader. And I suggest that that is a very, very biblical principle. Think about Moses with Aaron and Hur. Moses, again, when he was told, advised by his father-in-law, to appoint leaders to work with him and share the load. 
we'll come back to that in a little while. David with his mighty men. Uh, Jesus, of course, with the disciples. Peter with the eleven. Paul and his company. Let me say this, that while it's important to look at the main man, the leader, which Robert Harrison is doing tomorrow, I want to say I believe it's equally important to look at the leaders who work with the leader. Very important. Very important indeed. You see, it's not good for the leader to do everything. Even everything he's very good at. Let me say that even Jesus didn't do this. Let's look at this next picture. The feeding of the multitude, the feeding of the 5,000. If you read the narrative, you'll find that Jesus said, tell the people to sit down. So they had to do what they were told first, if they wanted any lunch. And then the Bible tells us that he gave the bread and the fish to who? The disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitude. Now I can imagine the attitude of some Christians, I want Jesus to give me my tuna fish sandwich. <laughs> and you laugh at that, but there are people who don't believe they've been visited unless they've been visited by the full-time man. Right? And Jesus, who could have done everything, he could have miraculously got around to every individual in that crowd and given them their food, but he didn't do it. He wanted the disciples involved. And that wasn't how it worked. So this is the picture, really. And it's a good picture. I believe we learn from what Jesus did, as well as what he taught. The goal is, you see, that every individual, one way or another, is cared for, ministered to, taught, and encouraged and built up. We all get excited about Yonggi Cho's church, and we say, oh Lord, do it here. Right, isn't it? And you may say, well, there must be people in Yonggi Cho's church who've never spoken to him. I understand that there are deacons in Yonggi Cho's church who've never spoken to him. Such is the concept, you see. But if God's people are looking up, being looked after, and if the work of God is growing, we've got to get excited about that, you see. My remarks primarily this morning are addressed to those working in leadership, like elders together with the main leader. And yet at the same time, some of the principles I'm looking at will apply in one measure or another to people like home group leaders, chief musicians, uh, and people like that. So as it applies to you, do take it to heart, youth ministers and so on. I want to look at the subject with a, a question approach. And so we're going to look at one question at a time. First of all, I want to ask ourselves a question, what kind of person are we looking for? What kind of person are we looking for? To be a leader alongside the leader. Herbert will say much more about character tomorrow, I'm sure. But I want to say, first of all, the important issue is character. More than gift, we'll come to that in a moment, but character. Character. The word that we get our English word character from is a, from a Greek word, spelled almost exactly the same. And we find it in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, where it talks about Jesus being the express image of God. And it's that word character. And it's really saying that if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. And if we're looking at character, we're saying that if you want to know what leaders should be like, look at Jesus. And so character, that imprint, that image of Christ, I believe needs to be a follow-on from the fact that Jesus, when he came, was the express image, picture of what God is like. You see, for you and I, we can theorize, we can teach doctrine on the person of God and the attributes of God. When it comes down to it, people want to know by experience. And the story is told of a little boy who was trying hard to get to sleep, but there was a thunderstorm raging. And Daddy went into the bedroom a few times and said, don't worry, God's here with you. And he prayed with him, went downstairs. A few moments later, another thunderclap. The little boy stood at the top of the stairs, terrified. And put him back to bed again, encouraged him again. The Lord's with you. Another thunderclap, the boy was scared and shaking. And Daddy said, I don't know what the problem is. I've told you the Lord's in there with you. I don't know about the Lord being in there with me. He said, I want somebody in there with some skin on. 
And the fact of the matter is, people need to be able to touch and relate to people with skin on. We need to be a revelation of Jesus. So we're looking for people of character. Character, essentially it's been said, is that seat of one's moral being. That quality in us that when we're under pressure, it survives and shines. And I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think of Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ. What a picture to emulate. Character. Jesus coming through. Jesus' own character coming through strong when the pressure was on. Think of James chapter 4 and verse 10. And 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. We talk a lot about resisting the devil. You must remember the scripture says, humble yourselves. Don't do it in pride. I believe character means that we need to be humble people if we're going to be leaders. God lifts up, exalts in due time, says Peter, if we humble ourselves. And if there is a time coming when you need to be in leadership or where you need to encourage others coming into leadership in your church, God will bring about that time in his time, but only if we're humble in our own hearts. These principles are important and apply especially to leaders, I'm sure. The whole principle of a servant's heart better example than Jesus. Exodus chapter 18. You know the story, I'm sure. Moses' father-in-law comes along and gives him a good bit of father-in-law advice. And I can imagine Moses saying, but I've never done it like that before. I have a vivid picture of Moses sitting in a tent, like a surgery, and this queue of people going miles into the distance in the wilderness. Estimates of the number of people go from 600,000 to well over a million. All queuing up for the little interview with Moses. And of course Jethro says, now you, you'll wear yourself away and you'll wear out the people too. And he says, let me give you some good advice and I believe God will be with you. And it says there very clearly, men who fear God. They all have various responsibilities, tens, fifties and so on. Yeah. Men of truth, men who hate dishonest gain, men with the right motives. That's character, isn't it? That's character and attitude. Men who were right with God, men who could be trusted. They were going to be leaders, but not the leader. God said to Moses, that's your job. You be the people's representative before me. That was Moses' task. Moses had to change. I noticed that when I was thinking about it this morning. And you know the problem when change comes, we don't mind as long as it doesn't have to change us. And I thought, a bit before my time of course, that some 70 years ago in this nation there were many people who were coming into the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And their church leaders were resisting them and the whole church was questioning it, this isn't right. But it was in the Word of God. It wasn't a new doctrine, it was there. God was bringing light to bear on it and people were discovering it. And now we take it for granted, we don't question it. It's amazing there are still people around today who deny that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is for today. It's amazing, but there are. So that happened, and yet now, as we come to this principle of men working together and gift ministries cooperating together, and principles like Moses and Jethro's advice, I still, I've always been there in the Word of God and we're discovering them and emphasizing them and some people are questioning them. It is a well-known fact that the last move of God in church history often forms the biggest wave of resistance to the next move. And I want to say from the depths of my heart, Lord, help me not to be like that. Help every one of us not to be like that. And I'm conscious of the fact too that some of you here this morning have seen some changes take place in your churches along these lines and you've struggled with it. Do go to the Word of God. Don't let tradition overrule like Jesus said. So character, what about gift? We must think about gift. What measure of gift is in them? I think of that list in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers who we need desperately all those ministry gifts until we all come to the unity of the faith. And we're not there yet, are we? 
By we, I don't just mean us here this morning. I mean the people of God. We're not there yet. And if we feel we don't need apostles and prophets, what do, why do we need evangelists, pastors and teachers? That is the context where they're all grouped together. That's my conviction. What measure of gift do they have? Think about this, and this may challenge some of our ideas. The leader in a church may not be a pastor. Let me repeat that. The leader of a local church may not be a pastor. Now the problem there is we said if he's the leader, he's the pastor. Not necessarily. The pastor is a shepherd. The leader may be a prophet. He may be a brilliant teacher. He may be like Cliff Beasley was talking about yesterday. A man who was at best a, a good pastor but brought other gifts in. But you may have a church where the leader has got a prophetic ministry. And he needs alongside of him leaders who will be, among others, pastors, teachers, evangelists and so on. So we need to try and re-examine our concepts along those lines. The leader needs those other ministry gifts and gift is important. When Jethro spoke to Moses, he said, find able men, men who were capable of doing something. They weren't just good fellows who sat around and encouraged Moses and said, well done Moses, you preached well this morning. They were men who were capable of doing something. Somebody once said that so many churches up and down the land are being led by dear brothers. Good men, but with little or no gift. Now that's sad, but we need sometimes to get on and move on in God to ask some hard questions about some of those situations. So gift is important. Balancing character and gift is vital. Absolutely vital. God's purpose is that who might be formed in us? Christ. God said at the very beginning in Genesis, let us make man in our image. Let's make man so that he's like us, a reflection of us. And God's purpose has never changed. Character must come first. It was mentioned yesterday in one of the meetings, I believe, that charisma and so on can attract so many people. But character is what endures. Character is what lasts. Let me hasten to add, I'm not saying that we must find perfect people. There aren't any around. And I was very struck one day listening to somebody talk from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, how Sam Ballot came along. And very sarcastically, I believe, said, do you really think you can build this? Do you really think you can finish it in a day? Can you offer sacrifices? Can you make something out of these stones, even these burned stones? And the walls have been broken down and burned. And I think Nehemiah might as well have turned around and said, well, there isn't anything else to build with. And I want to tell you this morning that Jesus looks at his church. And Satan, like Sam Ballot, might well say, looking at all of us, Jesus, can you really build a church with this lot? Have you seen the damage in some of their lives? The sin, the failures, the disappointments, the distress, the depressions and neuroses and so on. And the Lord Jesus would say, haven't any other material except burned stone. But you see, what the builders would do would take the stones, clean them up, dress them, get them ready to fit in where they should. And that's what the Lord Jesus is doing with his church. And that character must be developed. Think of Jesus and the twelve. What a motley crew. I remember Billy Richards speaking once at a lecture years ago on Peter the Apostle being interviewed by a ministerial selection board. And they say to Peter, uh, this instance where you chop this man's ear off, I mean, we're not very happy about that. <laughs> Does that mean if you're preaching and people aren't listening, you get your pen knife out and go and so <laughs> And this business of you denying Jesus in front of a young girl and even cursing that you never knew him. No, Jesus isn't looking for perfect people. God spoke to me once about this in my desire to find people who are just right to come into leadership. And God said, if I had waited as long as you are, you'd never be doing what you're doing now. So we're not looking for perfect people. The next question is, what kind of relationships are involved in this whole thing of working together? Being a leader, but not the leader. First of all, relationships with the team, including the leader. Imagine you are a leader on a team. You're not the leader. It's been suggested, and I want to show this picture of these three kinds of relationships, please. It's been pointed out that every leader 
every leader should desire three areas of relationship. One is that he needs a Paul, a mentor to follow. The other is that he needs a Jonathan or more than one Jonathan with whom to share his heart at a peer level like David and Jonathan did. And the other is that he should be having a Timothy who is teaching. And I like that principle. When I first heard that, I sat down and said, Lord, who's my mentor? Where's my Timothy? Who's my Jonathan? It was a real challenge to me. And it's important because you see the principle here at work is that leaders go on being reproduced. And Timothy becomes the person who has a Paul to follow and has somebody else to teach. And if you look around, spiritually speaking, somebody is following you. Somebody looks to you, for example. Somebody, if they hear that you believe something, they are more inclined to believe it. You're all leading and following somebody, when you think about it. In all this area of relationship, I would say friendship is so important. Peter Reed, who is the leader of the work in Stockport, the assembly in Stockport, we've enjoyed working together for some 11 years. And I felt prompted when I first began to talk to Peter about working with me, I said, Peter, I'm not looking for an assistant. I'm looking for a friend. Somebody who I can be open enough to sit down one day and say, Pete, I feel like chucking it all in. I've had a row with my wife and I just feel I've had it up to here and I can't possibly preach tonight. To be that honest. And he was a bit puzzled, but over the years we've seen the blessing of that. And there have been times when people have said to Peter and I, we're not working so closely together now because of our responsibilities changing, they've said, are you, they'd say to Peter, are you and Dave still together? Because so often teams split, but not always for good reason. And I believe the why, reason why God has blessed us is because of the friendship. I notice in Mark chapter 3, it says concerning Jesus, he chose them, first of all, that they might be with him. Jesus wanted their companionship. And you know that God loves to be with us. And our response to that is to enjoy being with him. Not always praying to him, not always listening to him, but just be with him. You remember what it was like when you were courting? You'd be quite happy to sit for three and a half hours just gazing into each other's eyes. Never say a word. Yet when we come to God in prayer, we, we pour it all out, the shopping list, a sort of spiritual version of going to Sainsbury's, and we pour it all out, and we get up off our knees and walk out, and I think God sometimes is saying, hey, I, I was just going to answer you. We need to enjoy being with him because he's our friend. And that principle in God has got to be worked out in leadership. Friendship is so important. Leaders working with the leader need to be friends with that leader and to love him and to be loyal to him. When Jesus talked about the good shepherd laying down his life for the sheep, that's the sort of loyalty we are looking for in areas of leadership relationships. You need to be able to enjoy meals and times of laughter and sadness together. Remember this though, as you study the life of Jesus, you'll find that, I'm sure it's been pointed out to you before, Jesus would have a relationship with the 5,000, a different relationship with the 12, a closer relationship with the three and a closer relationship with John. And we must recognize that individuals have closer friendships with different ones. You can't be friends at that close level with everybody. It isn't practical. You can never say to children, you go and be friends with Mrs. Smith's boys. He probably just thumped him down the street. You can't force relationships. They develop. So friendship's important. Think about the next area, the whole area of uh, relationships around prayer and the Word of God. If leaders working with the leader cannot enjoy relationship with him and with each other in this area, it isn't going to work. It isn't going to work. Acts 2.42 emphasizes the point which recurs constantly through the New Testament about together, being together, praying together. They were all together with one accord. Acts chapter 13, we find that early team, if you like, ministering to the Lord and fasting. And God spoke into the situation. Separate these two fellows. You see, relationship around the Word of God and in prayer together is vital. If we're talking about leaders 
working with the leader. Then I think in the area of vision, and I'm going to amplify on this in a moment, there needs to be a relationship based and built around or which forms and brings about a common vision. What does this word mean? Vision. We use it a lot, don't we? And you meet leaders and they say, uh, what's your vision? Oh, terrific. Yeah, but what do you mean? Oh, terrific. We're going for it. What do you mean going for what? Oh, for it. You know, what everybody else is going for. <laughs> when you really pin them down, they don't really know what they mean. But it's what everybody else is saying, so they say it. This is vision. And this is better vision. Yeah. <laughs> it's seeing, that's vision. And Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people go astray. They perish, they run amok, they do their own thing. They pull different ways. And it literally means where people can't see, they go every which way but the right way. And I believe God said to me one day, the real truth behind this scripture is that when people see Jesus in my people, they'll go the right way. I happen to believe that 95, 99% of this world's people are not stupid. They may be wicked, but they're not always stupid. And if they could see in Jesus and in his church a better way of life, they'd have the sense to go for it. But they've not seen it yet. And so vision essentially is seeing. And this next acetate, what Rosemary to put up, is talking about vision. It's a little diagram that shows various aspects of what we see vision is what you see for your local church, what you expect it to become, what you see looking ahead, you think God wants you to become as a people of God, as a local body. If you like, in the simplest form, that's vision. And we have these various points, like points on a compass. If we have a combination of vision that is common to everybody, everybody's got the same vision, but it's very vague, nobody knows quite what it is, but they're all going for it, then you get confusion. Nobody really knows what they're there for. If you have vision that is vague, and a lot of people have different vague visions and ideas of what their church ought to be, you get aggravation. If you have diverse vision, many people each with their own clear vision of what their church ought to be, essentially in the area of leadership, you will get division. Division. If you have a common vision that is very clear, you share it together, you will get unity. It's rather like, I was talking to one pastor, thank you, who was trying to lead his church, and he was having different groups of people coming in, helping him do this and that. I said, you know, this is crazy. It's rather like asking, deciding you want to build a house, somewhere to live, and you invite one builder in and he starts building you a bungalow. And then you see another builder and his work is good. You say, you can come and help me. And he starts to build a block of flats. And then you see another builder. You say, you're a good builder. You come and help me. And he comes and he starts putting up a four-bedroom detached house. It's a mess. Now, those kinds of dwellings all meet different needs. And churches in their local situation have to have a slightly different vision depending on their circumstances and the needs and where they are. You'd have a different vision in Liverpool in the city centre than you would maybe down in Cheam in Surrey. That's right, isn't it? You get the picture. So we've got to have a clear vision, a relationship based on vision. The next thing is a relationship where the members of the church are concerned. This leader, a leader who is not the leader, <coughs> what relationship is there? Now, Cliff mentioned yesterday about pinching somebody else's pastor. When Pete Reed was working with me as my pastor's assistant, then assistant pastor, then pastor, and now he's leading the work, or whatever we like to call him, there was a lady in the church, and she said, oh, Peter, you do preach well. One of these days, you'll have your own church. I said, he's already got it. It's this one. What she meant was, one day, some church will phone you up and say, Pete Reed, come to us. He was known by his people. They'd seen him grow up from a five-year-old. And the best kind of ministry, I believe, is homegrown. Best kind of leaders are homegrown. You see them. Because I'm saying, asking the question, do the people know this leader? And does he know them? This picture I want you to see now is this guy. He's got tremendous charisma. He's a brilliant preacher. He's good looking. He's had a perm. And he's got the best suit on and everything else. And the people are sitting in the congregation saying, we, we don't really know this guy. We understand the truth of what he's preaching, but we don't know his heart. 
We've got no relationship with him. And I would guess a terrific percentage of what he tries to achieve just goes over their heads. You see, the, do the people know him? Does he know them? Is he very much a part of the local body or is he in the appendage? Has he been stuck on the side? He's a good preacher. You see, it doesn't work. Proverbs 27, 23 says, know well the condition of your flocks. It literally means know the face of your sheep. <laughs> Recognise them. I don't know about you, we go around conferences like this and people say, hello Dave, and you think, what else is that? And you say hello to somebody and you know they've walked away saying, who's that? We don't see each other that often. When you're part of a local body meeting week by week, you know each other. And a, a homegrown leader who becomes a leader alongside the leader, the people know him. They know what he really means. He can't pretend. He can't pretend. Do the people know him and does he know them? Is he really a committed part of that local body? Second aspect of this very question is, do the people follow him? Let's have a look at this picture. Here's this same leader. He's got his badge on in case anybody forgets he's a leader. And he doesn't know it. If he looks around, they're all walking the other way. Nobody's following him. He's not a leader. John Shelbourne used to say, what a waste of time walking around saying, I'm a leader, I'm a leader. There's nobody following you. There's nobody following you. If you met a shepherd in those New Testament times, you said, what are you? I'm a shepherd. I've got 300 sheep. And you say, where are they? Oh, I don't know where they are. They're around somewhere. Do they come when you call? Do you know them? Do they know you? Well, no, but they're sheep and I'm a shepherd. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So relationship is very important. Do they trust him? Is he a leader? I believe with all my heart there needs to be an element of shepherd's heart in every kind of leader. That's my own feeling. And uh, that willingness to lay down one's life. Very important. Do the people feel that these leaders being brought in to work with the leader are people they can trust? Relationship. Third question I want to ask is, what are the responsibilities involved? What is it all about? Who's doing what? What's going on? First of all, relationships and responsibilities now in the team or within the team. If you are a leader with the leader, I want to say that you have a responsibility to the leader. You must care about him and his family, to serve him, and let me use this word, in the right sense, to submit to him. It doesn't mean he's a dictator. Dictatorship never works in the church of Jesus. Jesus was never a dictator. You know, have you ever found that when he wants you to do something, he doesn't say, oh, you, do this. And when he says, I want you to do this, and you struggle, you say, Lord, I can't do it. He doesn't say, oh, right then, forget it. Very patient, isn't he? And I believe here's a word for every leader this morning. Deal with people as God has dealt with you. Deal with people as God has dealt with you. So you need, in a right sense, to submit to the leader. The buck has got to stop somewhere, folks. Somebody eventually has got to carry the can. Somebody with experience, somebody with that measure of gift, and calling in God, who is the leader among leaders, you need to recognise that. And your responsibility and your relationship towards him must involve this. You also have a responsibility in this next aspect, which is priorities. I hope we realise that when we become a leader, the telephone's going to ring more often. There's going to be more demands made on us. There's going to be those times when the leader says, I need you guys together tomorrow. But, and you've got to shift your schedule. Now don't misunderstand me, I believe more than anything else that my family must come before my church. Let me repeat that. If the Lord Jesus was standing here addressing leaders, he would not say, how big's your church? He would say, how's your wife? How's your kids? Are you shepherding that immediate flock that's your responsibility? But in that context, there's going to be a shift of priorities. Matthew 6 and verse 33 says what? Seek first the kingdom of God. That priority still applies. Let me challenge you this morning. If in your involvement as a leader, or the possibility of becoming a leader, or your desire to be a leader, is in your heart and the opportunity for promotion comes in your secular job, that means if you take up that promotion you're going to be less available, what would your decision be? 
Where does the kingdom fit in? And where does the local church fit in in your priorities? There is a responsibility there to work with your diary and your list of priorities and to know what is important. That's a serious responsibility. I do not see the sense of being with leaders who say, well, yeah, I could do it, but you know, I'm, I'm playing golf and I can't be off and look after this person and so on. There's something wrong there somewhere. I don't think that means they must be at everybody's beck and call. They need time off desperately. The priorities. Responsibilities now concerning the specific role that the person has. What is your task as a leader? This is practical. The other is principle, priorities and relationship with the leader. What are your, what's your role? Do you know what you're supposed to be doing? It's no good having a football team and the captain says, you're all in my team, you guys. So what am I? Well, it doesn't really matter what you are. Just be in the team. Get on the field. Kick the ball around a bit. Somebody once said he noticed the difference when his local football team was way down in the fourth division. The supporters would shout out, kick it up the middle. By the time they were up in the second division, they were saying, pass it to so-and-so. Get it out on the wing. They were being more specific. And part of that was because the members of the team knew where they were supposed to be, where their responsibility ended. The centre forward wouldn't go dashing back every time there was a risk of the opposition scoring a goal and push the goalie out of the way and stand there ready to save it. It wasn't his job. Could a job description help? Oh, that's a bit uh, worldly. That, I tell you, it's not a bad idea. If you are a youth leader, a youth pastor working with the leader, do you know what your responsibilities are? Does it include organising camps? Does it include every so often saying to the leader, I would love the young people and the children to take a Sunday morning meeting sometime. Have you ever done that? Did it at our church recently. I turned up, I was to preach, and I remember the youngsters were taking the meeting. The chairs had all gone, except for some. And they came in, and they were praising God, exciting. I couldn't keep, I was out of breath. You don't have to be holy to go to church. You have to be fit these days. <laughs> But his task was to urge us on and to, to provoke us and say, come on, what can the youngsters do in this? He, he needs to know his boundaries. If he's the visitation pastor, the visitation minister, does he know who he should visit and who he shouldn't? If you're a home group leader, do you know where your responsibilities end and where you call in more experienced help? That's why there are so many problems. People don't know where the boundaries are. Delegation is an important aspect of this whole thing of specific role. Delegation is not abdication. When the leader says to you, this is your responsibility, it does not mean that he doesn't want to hear about it again. There must be a sense of accountability. He must be really a bit like Moses, being the people's representative before God. And it doesn't mean he could say to God, well God, I know the fellow with 50 made a right hash of it, but I gave him the job and I just left him to it. It's no good, is it? Delegation and how we handle that is very, very important. Then let's think about the problems that can arise. Oh dear, you say, surely there aren't problems among leaders. Oh, you better believe it. Can you see that right from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, the thing that the enemy was out to do was to spoil the relationship between two people brought together? What is it the scripture says about smiting the shepherds and scattering the sheep? So you be sure to pray for your leaders. That is where the enemy will go first. There can be problems. This is where most problems, I think, arise. There is, if you like, the competitive element, jealousy. One church I know where uh, a fellow came to be the main leader, and one of the two elders there had been leading the work very effectively over three years, but felt the need to call somebody in who they knew and had a relationship with the church to lead the work on. So in effect, in effect he sort of stepped down a bit. Uh, and somebody came to him and says, how do you feel? He said, what do you mean? Well, she says you've been dethroned. <laughs> Once you start talking about being dethroned, you make excellent opportunity for threats and coups. You do. Once you start talking like that, there need to be decisions made. And we're talking about partnership, not a power struggle. And this is so important. 
We're not out to score points off each other. It's why honest, heart-to-heart -heart relationship is a vital key. Ephesians 4.15 talks about speaking the truth in love. And it actually says in the Amplified New Testament, Let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, and living truly. That's relationship, you see. Keep short accounts with each other. Don't let the competitive element creep in. What we are talking about is what I've got on the screen here is cooperation, not competition. We're talking about complementing each other's ministries rather than competing with each other's ministries. You realise something? A leader may well very often preach better than the leader. What about that? But it doesn't make him the leader. You see, it doesn't make him the leader. It doesn't mean that he should immediately be taking up the responsibilities of the leader because he's preached well and 50 people have got saved. It's about cooperation. That's where problems can arise. We'll say a lot more about that. But this heart-to-heart -heart closeness, openness with each other, being close enough to be able to be the kind of friend who stick closer than a brother and whose wounds can hurt each other but be better for you than the kisses of an enemy. That's what we're talking about. And that is essentially the principle. Have you ever noticed some people have got a version of the Bible? I'm sure they've got it because it's how they live it. In Matthew 18, and they read, if your brother offends you, go and tell everybody else except him. Because that's what they do. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. Right? Say amen if you're still awake. <laughs> and it's awful because the scripture says, if your brother offends you, go and tell him. Brother, you annoyed me when you said that this morning. I know I'm leaving myself wide open for you to all come and do it after I've finished. <laughs> I'm running that way. <laughs> but you see, it's so important. It's so important, that Matthew 18 principle. Keep short accounts. Avoid room for competition and for the devil to sow thoughts and say, you preach better than him. Why is he still the leader? He's older now. The time you took over. Oh, I tell you, that's wicked talk. Problems with the church, in the church as a whole body. What about there? Let me say something. I think it's very important, this. The people need for it to be very plain. Habakkuk 2, verse 2, God said to Habakkuk, write the vision, make it plain. Write down what you see in me and make it plain so that the people who read it can run with it. And a lot of problems are because people in the body don't understand what the leadership are trying to do. I think that's why sometimes some people struggle with what musicians are trying to do. They've learned things and learned principles about the biblical concept of worship and they're there getting into it and the people in the congregation are sitting there going... Because they don't know what it's about. We don't only need to teach our musicians the principles of biblical music and praise, we need to teach the whole people. We need our, all of our people to understand what leadership is about. Not just the leaders. Very important. So they need to understand so that they're not saying, I haven't had a visit lately, when the home group leader's been round, the youth pastor's been round concerning their children, and so on, and they're look, being looked after, but the leader hasn't been to see them. Now, I'm not wanting to be unkind on that, because there are times when you don't want to make these rules so rigid they can never be broken. There are needs when the leader needs to get to a situation. But try and help the people to understand. And if you are a leader, not the leader, you must promote those principles. And you must support the basis on which you're working. I have said to our church, our home group leaders are the pastors in this church. And I said, our youth leader is the youth pastor. And I said, oh, is he going full time? <laughs> Nothing to do with it. He is shepherding the young people. That's his heart. <coughs> and our home group leaders are essentially shepherding the people. They are the pastors of 10 or 12 people. Some of them, they're brilliant at it. Need to understand that. And the people need to understand it. There are a lot of pastors here this morning. I don't mean pastors are in the Assemblies of God yearbook. I mean people who are good at caring for people. There's a principle there. 
You may be a pastor because you seem to attract people with needs and you seem to be able to care for them and encourage them and shepherd them and they feel secure and they've never had a visit from the pastor because you are pastoring. You may be the sort of person who go to work and win 25 people to Christ in a month. You're an evangelist. Well, but I'm not Billy Graham. Not all evangelists are like Billy Graham. You may have noticed that. You see the principle at work. People need to understand these things so they can understand what is happening. We need to examine our concepts on this. It's been said that people maybe need to hear these principles taught three times before they've understood it. And then only when they see it happening and get behind it is it really done. The other aspect of this, where the church is concerned, is people do make choices. And it could be seen that they listen to the leader preach, and they give him 6 out of 10, like the judges do on the skating competition. And then a leader gets up, and all the young people are rooting for him because he's the youth pastor, and he gets 8, 9, 10 out of 10. People think like that. But you see, that doesn't undermine the principle of being a leader, but we're still with the leader. One fellow talked about the supernatural. He said, to me, the supernatural was in operation in our Sunday morning service a little while ago. He said, I preached. I felt it wasn't really the unburdening of my heart. I felt God help me. And to my discouragement, one lady came to me in the week and she said, you know, I've got to tell you, I've got nothing out of your Sunday morning service. And my friend sitting with me felt the same. He felt really discouraged. Then another person found him up and said, I've got to tell you, your message Sunday morning really got to me. So much so that I made a commitment to Jesus. <laughs> don't use the phrase, one man's meat's another man's poison. That's not what we're talking about. We are talking about roles and blessings coming from one person to another. Let's recognise the fact that even if people in your church relate at a personal level better to one of the leaders than they do to the leader, don't deny them that privilege. If you understand it and work with it, it can be to benefit. If people feel secure with one of the leaders on the team and they relate to that person, as long as there's no confidentiality thing going on where nobody knows anything, it's all top secret and so on, as long as there's an openness there, that will work. It really will. <coughs> one of the benefits, I believe, of team ministry. What are the benefits now? I want to talk about the benefits, last of all. There is the one, of course, of shared responsibility. And what a delight it is not to have to carry the whole thing on one's own. To share the responsibility. Proverbs 11.14 says, There is safetyitude in the multitude of counsellors. Safety, not safetyitude. Safety in the multitude of counsellors. I knew I'd say something wrong. <laughs> Difficult decisions are best shared, especially when you're dealing with people's lives. So the joy of shared responsibility. If you are a leader working under the leader or with the leader, you will very likely avoid making some of the big mistakes and dropping some of the clangers that he made while he was on his own. All right? A benefit. Tremendous relief from pressure. You bear one another's burdens at the same time carrying your own. You share them together. You don't release them, you don't give them up, but you help each other. There is a value, the benefit of protection. The team members, the leaders together should be looking after each other. If you're one of a group of leaders who care about each other. Issues like when one of them is overworking, one of them needs a break, their families need caring for, one of them, his wife is in hospital, and he needs time off, he needs a break. That's where that group will work together, the benefits of sharing that load. I regret very, very much the fact that years ago, when I was pastoring a church and had the view of the ministry such that if my children had an open evening, a parents' evening, and it clashed with the meeting night, I could not go to the parents' evening. I believe I was wrong. But I had nobody to share it with. I'd rather close the meeting now than go to the parents' evening. All right? I've gone a bit quiet there. All right? <laughs> what about leaders' wives? Our wives, where do they fit in? Apart from loving us and looking after us and putting up with us and saying to us after we preach, that was a mess. <laughs> Have you ever noticed, you fellows who preach, you come away from the meeting and you say to your wife, oh, I just didn't get it this morning. She says, it was terrific. Another time you come away, I felt the Lord really helped me. She says, it was all right. 
Maybe you don't have that. <laughs> Maybe your wife just lies. <laughs> I want to say this. And maybe some of this comes out of Rosie's and my personal relationship. We have the delight of working closely together, traveling thousands of miles together. And if we couldn't get on together, we'd drive each other crazy. The hours and days and weeks we spend all the time together. It is my conviction, I feel that where leaders are concerned, their wives should know about everything their partner is involved in where church is concerned. I really believe that our wives need to know what we are doing. We get very sad and we all look back and say, well, I thought there was something wrong when a fellow falls morally. And you know, we need to be fair to our wives. Our wives need to know who we're visiting, what we're doing. So they can say, like some good wives do, I don't think you should go there. I'll come with you. I'll come with you. Our wives need to know, because it's not just like an ordinary job. I think David Owen said it. It isn't a job, it's our life. And when you do blow it, you've not lost your job. You've lost your whole life and ministry. Right. I, that's my conviction. There may be a few exceptions to that rule, but very, very few. We may not like the word covering, but we do need covering. We do need looking out for, don't we? Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. We need people around us who will hurt us if necessary to save us and protect us. I found Psalm 141 verse 5 and I was reading it and I thought, that's a lovely saying. Let the righteous smite me and reprove me. Let the good people smack me around the face and bring me to my senses. Well, that's my paraphrase, all right? Isn't it? The other aspect of this, of course, is working within our gift. This is a benefit of being a leader but not the leader. You're not going to be stretched into doing something you're not capable of. There is a principle in management, secular management, that's well understood and it's called the danger of promotion beyond the level of competence. The danger of promotion beyond the level of competence. You may be a brilliant pe preacher, do a brilliant good bit of preaching and so on and say, so, well, he's got to be an elder and he gets, becomes an elder and makes a mess of it. Wasn't his calling. And the protection of feeling you haven't got to climb that ladder that's how you look at it. I hope you don't. We avoid the risk of trying to do what we're not good at. We enjoy the security of doing what we're good at while others do what they're good at. Let me correct that. Do what we're best at. We may be good at lots of things. But the joy of doing what we're best at and what God wants us to do. There is a benefit of fellowship and encouragement. That should be a real delight. Not to be a lonely leader. Rosemary and I travel around quite a bit and we meet a lot of lonely leaders. They need leaders around them. A friend loves at all times, says the scripture, and a brother is born for adversity. Not to beat him up, but to be with him in times of difficulties. That's what real brothers and sisters are for. Security. This affects the whole church. I said earlier on that sheep feed better when they feel secure. You don't want to eat. You know what it's like when you're uptight and you're screwed up and somebody says, well, have your dinner. I can't eat. It's the same principle. And the people of God don't benefit from that. Those Ephesians 4 ministries are there to develop the people of God so that they do the work of the ministry. We know that, but we haven't really got it together yet. Now, people need to see the leader, the leader's gift supported by those around him. We want to grow up into Christ, which is what the goal of Ephesians 4 is. To become mature. That's your privilege. Then the development of ministries. Potential here is tremendous. When I mentioned earlier on about the relationship with Paul, a relationship with a Jonathan, and a relationship with Timothy, let me challenge leaders here this morning. Get one, at least one Timothy on your leadership team. You may make a pig's ear of a lot of things. But you've got to learn. Let me suggest, for the sake of time, that you go away and study the development of the relationship between Barnabas and Saul, who eventually became Paul. When nobody would vouch for Saul when he came, the New Testament church said, we don't trust this guy, Barnabas did. And he vouched for him. Barnabas gets sent to Antioch and he sends for Saul. Saul comes to help him. They send a gift with Barnabas and Saul. Still Barnabas and Saul. Separate Barnabas and Saul in that order. Separate those two. Barnabas and Saul. But then Saul called Paul in Acts 
13 comes to the fore and begins to deal in ministry. Then we hear of Paul and his companions. Then we hear Paul preaching. And the picture shifts. And it begins to be described in later verses as Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas. What's happening? Paul is developing beyond the guy who brought him in. I wonder how many of you leaders are ready for that. To get a Timothy who then eventually streaks ahead of you. I felt I was reading the book of Acts once. I had a long train journey and I was able to read the book of Acts right through twice. And I felt the Lord said to me, how willing are you to gather a Saul, even though he might be a problem, and eventually be prepared and be blessed by seeing him blessed in areas of ministry that you've never touched? Oh, I can handle that. It's a threat. I didn't feel like that. And I've honestly rejoiced to see Pete Reed in Stockport being blessed in areas of ministry I don't feel I've ever really broken into. And then, of course, the whole thing comes up with Paul and Barnabas. They argue and they split up and they go their separate ways with their own teams. Now, it didn't have to be that disastrous. You do realise that Paul didn't always get everything right. Peter didn't do everything right, did he? That's why Paul told him off when he met him. Yeah, you're a hypocrite, Peter. Ooh, it's one of God's anointed, but he did it wrong. When I was struggling with this and thinking about it, the thought came to me, but then leadership is not about getting everything right. In case you hadn't realised it, your leaders are not perfect, are they? They make mistakes, don't they? But leadership is not about doing everything exactly right. It's about leading. And being honest enough sometimes to say, folks, I felt this was the right way, but obviously I got it a bit wrong. And if they're loyal to you, they'll say, thanks for being honest, we'll follow you. The conclusion is this, simply, that being a leader with the leader, whichever way it goes, you can't lose. If on the one hand, being a leader, working with the leader, your ministry develops to the point where you eventually become the leader in a different situation, planting out a church or something like that, praise God for it. But if your privilege is to go on being a leader with the leader, rejoice in that as well. Rejoice in that. Because if that's the sphere and measure of your gift and calling, that's where God will bless you. It's not about competition. I get tired of people saying to me when I'm in their church, I say, what do you do in the church? I'm only a Sunday school teacher. I hate that phrase. You've probably got the most responsible role in the church. I don't expect you to come up and say, I'm a Sunday school teacher. No, but don't minimise what you've got to do. Maybe you're not the main man. Maybe yours is not the name that appears at the top of the letterhead or on the notice board. It has nothing to do with it, folks. It hasn't got a hoot to do with it. It's if you are where God wants you to be and you are who God wants you to be, that is the key. A phrase came to mind, and I had to check with Peter Snook on this, that I'd got it right. And he wrote it out for me. And I've written it out on the screen here. Many of you will recognise this phrase. It comes from Howard Carter. Lord, let me ever love thee more than thy service and know that to be in thy will is better than success. And he was thinking of what the world calls success. Maybe you're a leader and you've been a leader for years. If that's where God wants you and that's where he's keeping you blessed and secure, thank God for it Thank God every day that you're not the leader. You know what I mean by that? You see, it's a privilege to serve, isn't it? It's a privilege to serve. I want to say to you this morning, if some of these principles are things that we find difficult to work with, we really need to get before God and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Now, some of you may feel, well, I'm past it, I've gone past my usefulness. Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? We heard of a lady the other day whose husband had left her about six months ago. Drastic situation. She's only 31. This mother of two small boys. And she was telling Rosemary tremendous comfort and encouragement and leadership, I would say, she found in a widow in the church. Many, many years her senior 
who had struggled for different reasons with the same sense of loneliness. And she was able to help her. It's not all about the bright rising stars of leadership. It's not all about those who spring up from Bible college and say, Church, here I am, what are you going to pay me? That is nothing to do with that. It is about people who are willing to serve, willing to lead when they're called upon and not lead when they're not called upon. God has called you I want you to encourage those who are leaders but not the leader. Understand that if that's God's heart for them, that's where God will anoint them and bless them. Amen.